In 1945, Arthur C. Clarke, the author of many science fiction works, including the popular 2001 A Space Odyssey and Childhood's End, among many, many others, began circulating a paper he'd written in which he proposed a bizarre concept, placing what he called space stations into orbit around the Earth and using these stations to beam radio waves down onto the surface of the planet. This concept was bizarre in large part because of when it was proposed. In 1945, World War II had just ended, and television had recently been invented but hadn't yet been popularized. The 525-line television standard had only been formally adopted by the U.S. government in 1941, the same year that color broadcasting field tests were being conducted by the still young CBS and NBC networks. Actual consumer-grade availability of color broadcasts didn't become available until 1952, nearly a decade after Clark's paper was circulated. And that's important because although the popularity of black and white TV grew throughout the 40s and into the 50s, the majority of homes in the U.S. still relied on radio as their primary means of entertainment and as their primary source of news at that time. Despite... That timing, Clark posited in his paper that, among other things, these space stations up in orbit around Earth could be used to beam television signals down to Earth, solving the last mile problem of information broadcasting, which was an issue both then and is still an issue now, though for different types of information transmission, different media. In other words, it's a relatively simple thing to build a network of cables that disseminate communication signals, We've been doing that for a while, after all, with telegraph cables, which stretched across the ocean floor, connecting the continents to each other. But connecting those mainline backbone cables to individual homes and businesses, that was a lot trickier and far more expensive. This last mile problem continues to be an issue today, though with high-speed fiber optic cable-based internet rather than television signals. Clark's theory here was that rather than trying to physically connect all these disparate locations via a network of cables, why not put a broadcasting machine, a megaphone, for all these radio waves up in space, and then use that space-based megaphone to project radio waves down over a huge radius, a cone of broadcasting area, so that everyone under the cone could simply access the proper wavelength, the proper channel, and tap into whatever was being broadcast. That same year, Clark formalized this concept with a paper he had published in Wireless World magazine, which was entitled, Extraterrestrial Relays. Can Rocket Stations Give Worldwide Radio Coverage? In this piece, he doubled down on the concept of stations up in space, beaming information down onto the planet, each station bathing a huge swath of the Earth in these waves, and those waves able to be tapped into by anyone with the proper receiving device, the right antenna, basically. He posited that the rockets used by the Germans during the war, the V-2, which was used to horrific effect late in the war in particular, when the Germans bombarded London and other European targets as the Allies moved in on Berlin, that missile could have a second life as a peaceful device, launching these stations up into space, docking them in a safe geostationary orbit, meaning an orbit that causes it to swing around the planet at the same pace that the planet spins, so that it would appear motionless in the sky if we were looking up at it from the surface of the planet, and those stations could then be used for all manner of broadcasting purposes. Now, Clark gets the majority of the credit for this innovative concept, which, you may have guessed, later led to the concept of satellites, and more specifically, of geostationary satellites, and later, communication satellite arrays, which are collections of satellites that surround the planet and which ensure that wherever you are, more or less, you can tap into the same communications network as anyone else on the planet. He gets the majority of credit for this because he popularized the idea and fleshed it out, telling the story of what these things could do, how they could be used, making the practical applications obvious to anyone who might wonder about them. 
He also managed to get those ideas in the right hands and to get them published for widespread consumption. As a result, the portion of space surrounding Earth where these types of satellites live today, located at 22,236 miles above sea level, which is about 35,768 kilometers above sea level, directly above the equator, which is the only practical location for satellites used for the purposes he described, those that are in geosynchronous orbit around the planet, that layer of space was named for him. It's called the Clark Belt, and this type of orbit is colloquially referred to as the Clark Orbit. But Clark wasn't the first or only person to theorize about this application for space-based machines. Another science fiction author, George O. Smith, wrote on the topic from time to time, though he and other speculators in this field never went into the same detail and extrapolative depth that Clark went into in his pieces. So this was an idea that was in the ether, you might say, and Arthur C. Clarke plucked it out and riffed on it and theorized about it and wrote stories about it and got those stories into the public's hands. Less than 12 years later, the Soviet satellite and first ever satellite, Sputnik, was successfully launched, catalyzing the space race and everything that came with it. In 1965, 20 years after Clarke's paper was written and disseminated, a company called Intelsat launched the first geostationary satellite system. As of late 2017, there were just under 5,000 satellites orbiting the planet, around 1,700 of which are still active. And that doesn't take into account all the space junk, by the way. All the pieces of broken satellites and paint chips from rockets and other random bits of debris that are big enough to track. There's about a half million pieces of trash of trackable size up there. So the number of active, purposeful technology that is up there right now is dwarfed by the number of inactive, utilityless chunks of rubbish. But there are different numbers here, depending on what you're counting and when you're counting and what type of orbit you're looking at. Like if you're tracking things that come near the Earth sometimes, but which actually have an orbit far outside the planet's gravity well, that's a very different thing from something that is in geosynchronous orbit. The United Nations website actually has a page where you can search for all the registered objects that have been launched into space for tracking purposes. And as of the day I'm recording this, the number of objects on that website is at 8,074. So that's over 8,000 things, all kinds of things, that have been launched into space into orbit around the Earth and otherwise. The most recent item on that list is a Tesla Roadster sports car, which was launched very recently to much fanfare and to heliocentric orbit by SpaceX. What I want to talk about today actually starts with SpaceX, but then expands to include a large number of other companies, some that have been around since the early days of space technology, and some that are very new. And these companies are competing with each other, with superpower level governments, and in some ways both with and against an ever-growing collection of regulators and regulations that are making their industry a strange and cluttered place. Today I want to talk about satellites, and specifically a facet of the modern space race that is focused on blanketing the planet with high-speed internet from above. <music> You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent listener-supported show. If you are enjoying what you hear, consider leaving a quick review up on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Those things only take a moment to leave, and they help a whole lot more than you might suspect, particularly for a show like this, which is a little bit unusual, a little bit genre-straddling. Those reviews, especially en masse, help people who are not yet familiar with the show decide to give it a shot. And then from there, there's not a whole lot that we can do about it. They'll like it or they won't. But that initial opportunity is a big deal in building an audience long term. And those reviews help a whole lot in that regard. You might also consider becoming a patron if you want to help support the show financially. If you go to patreon.com slash let's know things, you can contribute however much makes sense to you and your financial situation each month. 
It's those contributions in large part that allow me to spend as much time as I do on this show each week. And I very much appreciate everyone who is contributing to the production of the show in some way, shape, or form, financially or otherwise. Thank you very much for that. I truly appreciate it. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I want to unspool today comes from Ars Technica, and it's entitled SpaceX Hits Two Milestones in Plan for Low Latency Satellite Broadband. This piece was published a few weeks before I'm recording this, back on February 14th of 2018, and that's important because it references the lead-up to a fairly spectacular event. Spectacular in the sense that it was one of the most watched events in YouTube history. Millions of people tuned in simultaneously, and it was also a first in aerospace history. And that event was the launching of SpaceX's new Falcon Heavy style rocket, which, and this is the part that more people will probably know about and remember about the event, that Falcon Heavy rocket carried SpaceX founder Elon Musk's personal Tesla Roadster electric sports car into space. Now that launch, which was promoted as being a 50-50 shot, so definitely not a sure thing, a decent chance that it would fail, ended up being a huge promotional opportunity for Musk and SpaceX. They put a spacesuit-wearing dummy in the driver's seat of the car and loaded the vehicle with science fiction references, among them a towel in the glove compartment and a sign on the dashboard that says Don't Panic, both references to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And the car radio was playing Space Oddity by David Bowie when it was launched. And the space-suited figure driving the car has come to be known as Starman, another Bowie reference. But the main point of this launch was to show off their new Falcon Heavy rocket, which is massively larger and more powerful than any of their other rockets. It nearly triples the payload capacity of the Falcon 9, which is the rocket that makes up the internal frame of this heavier version, which is good because the rockets on all the Falcon models are partially reusable. And during this initial launch of the heavier model, both side boosters that were added to that smaller frame to make it big, they safely, autonomously landed themselves so that they can be used again in the future. And though they did not attempt to recover the second stage of the rocket this time around, that is apparently something that will be possible in future launches. SpaceX was also able to show off their in-space maneuverability, pivoting the sports car around to nudge it into a heliocentric orbit that will cross Mars's orbit, though it will not get anywhere close to Mars, which was intentional, as slamming a sports car into a planet that we're trying not to infest with Earth-based microbes, that would be kind of a dick move. Adjusting the path of the craft to ensure it could make its way out to Mars, though, made the point that SpaceX was not just capable of launching big stuff into space, it's also capable of sending that big stuff out to Mars which in the broader context of SpaceX and Elon Musk's other projects, that makes a whole lot of sense, even if the business sense of that specific milestone is not immediately evident, lacking that larger context. So let's talk about that bigger picture real quick before diving back into the broader space industry story that's being told here. Elon Musk believes that we need to become a multi-planetary species, and we need to do this pretty much yesterday for a variety of reasons, and among them is that we kind of have all of our eggs in one basket at the moment. So one well-aimed asteroid, or one significant global nuclear conflict, and we're done for as a species. This is a belief that is shared by many luminaries in technology, in science, in philosophy. Stephen Hawking brings it up in essentially every interview that he does these days, and it's considered to be one solution among many that could help us alleviate some of those species-ending risks. But it could also help us unify around a grand project, a grand series of projects, really, to come together as a species, knocking down some of the perceived differences, giving us something on which we can work together, regardless of where we were born. It could also help us see planets and our ecology differently could help us see its potential frailty, but also our capabilities in playing a role and not messing it up, our potential power to save the environment of our current planet. 
That bigger picture vision, in other words, could help us become better versions of ourselves. It could vastly increase our collective perspective. So this opinion isn't unusual, especially amongst people who know a whole lot about the factors involved. But what is unusual is the degree to which Musk has dedicated himself to the goal of getting to Mars and building a colony there. Within his lifetime, starting that next stage of human development, where Earth is not the only place that we've got members of our species tucked away, living life, so that humans have multiple baskets, not just one. His businesses are all, to varying degrees, oriented around that goal. And he has many businesses. His initial fortune came from co-founding PayPal back in the day. But he invested much of those resources in SpaceX, which is the company that's building all these rockets, including, importantly, reusable rockets meant to dramatically lower the cost of going into space, and Tesla, which is an electric car company that is also, and maybe more so, actually a battery company, which makes products, including cars, that benefit from being able to store vast quantities of energy and then use that energy more intentionally. He's on the board and an investor in a solar power company called Solar City, which, among other things, is systematizing the process of installing solar panels on homes, and which has developed aesthetically pleasing solar tiles that will allow spendy homeowners to have the benefits of solar panels without the traditional bulky, sometimes eyesore, solar panels. And he's also founded a handful of other companies that are currently receiving less of his attention, but which are nonetheless attracting a lot of media hype due to their ambition. One of them is the Hyperloop, which is a frictionless vacuum tunnel-based mode of transportation that could dramatically reduce travel times between major cities. Another is Neuralink, which is a device that would allow people to communicate brain to brain using what amounts to an injectable mesh, a device that goes inside of our skulls that would allow our brains to connect to each other and to connect with artificial intelligences, which could, in theory, give us additional and expandable memory and processing power and always-on connections to the internet and other things of that nature. And then most recently, at the end of 2016, he founded The Boring Company, which is a business oriented around boring giant tunnels to create new transportation channels, ostensibly with the goal of reducing traffic congestion, but also possibly with the additional goal of creating additional vectors through which autonomous cars could travel, smoothing the transition to the widespread adoption of that technology. He also co-created a nonprofit called OpenAI, which is an organization that aims to ensure artificial intelligence is developed in a way that is beneficial to humanity rather than, you know, destroying us in one of many colorful and terrifying ways. So the man's busy, and he's been hiring all kinds of talented people to work on these various efforts, and all of them tie together to augment the others in sometimes quite subtle and other times quite overt ways. Launching his personal Tesla sports car into space, using the new SpaceX vehicle, for instance, was a clever way to promote the former while showing off the capabilities of the latter. Building out solar panel infrastructure is an excellent way to ensure more clean energy is available so it can be stored in Tesla battery walls and city-scale energy storage systems, while also bolstering the broad clean energy infrastructure required to make electric cars truly clean, in the sense that they are not powered by coal or gas. It's into this context that we can now insert this piece from Ars Technica about the satellites that were approved for launch by SpaceX during the Falcon Heavy launch, the one where the sports car was sent into heliocentric orbit. Starlink is a project currently under development by SpaceX, and the purpose of this project is to develop low-cost, high-performance satellite buses that can be used for a variety of purposes. A satellite bus is essentially a satellite frame. When you picture a satellite and you think about a maybe cube-like node filled with technology and then arms off to the side that look like fins and contain solar panels, that's the bus. You can put whatever you want onto the satellite bus into this frame, but the bus itself is fairly modular and standardized, which is beneficial in some ways and very limiting in other ways. What they hope to accomplish 
with Starlink, then, is twofold. First is to create a satellite product similar to their rocket product, meaning they can hire it out to whomever wants to use it and for whatever purpose. That means, in the case of SpaceX, governments, corporations, and eventually, potentially, private individuals who want to go up into space for whatever reason. The Falcon Heavy is currently the most powerful rocket in operation on the planet, and it's the fourth highest capacity rocket ever built, after the Saturn V, which was made by Boeing in the 60s and 70s, and the N1 and Energia rockets, both of which were made by the Soviets in the 70s and 80s, respectively. For comparison, the U.S. space shuttle had a payload capacity of 6,600 pounds, or about 27,500 kilograms, while the Falcon Heavy can carry more than double that. 140,700 pounds, or about 63,800 kilograms. So they wanted to build a rocket that could lift heavy things, but which would also be cheaper due to the use of existing parts, those that are mass-produced for their other Falcon rockets, and also due to the reusability of some of the biggest, most expensive components of these rockets, which use AI to float themselves back to Earth safe and sound. If you have not seen a video of those pieces of rockets floating themselves back down to Earth, fully upright, by the way, I will link to some videos of that in the show notes. It's pretty cool to watch. So the goal with these satellites is to do something similar to that for this other aspect of the space industry, to create a satellite structure that is multi-purpose, better than the alternatives in a variety of ways, but also cheaper which usually means using different components, but also, perhaps more importantly, making a whole lot of them. So how do you justify making gobs of satellites so that each individual satellite bus costs less than it would otherwise? Well, that's where the second thing that they hope to accomplish with Starlink comes into play. One way to lower those costs is to develop your own satellite array to beam internet down to Earth. And that's the other purpose of Starlink, to place thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit and shroud the planet in high-speed connectivity, and then sell that connectivity to existing internet companies and also directly to individuals, the same way that you might buy mobile internet today from T-Mobile or Virgin, you could possibly buy it someday from SpaceX, tapping into this satellite mesh rather than traditional ground-based mobile signal towers. The goal here currently, and I say currently because their estimates have changed fairly dramatically since it was first announced in January 2015, those estimates could absolutely change again, is to have around 12,000 satellites in orbit in their array by the mid-2020s. As I mentioned in the intro of this episode, there are currently around 5,000 satellites orbiting the planet right now. And a great many of those are no longer active, or no longer fully active. This project alone would require more than double that total. What's more, these satellites are meant to orbit far closer to the ground than most existing satellites, from around 1,110 kilometers, which is about 690 miles, to 1,325 kilometers, or 823 miles, above sea level. For comparison, the International Space Station occupies an orbit from 401.1 kilometers to 408 kilometers above sea level, which is about 249.2 miles to 253.5 miles above sea level. That's not quite one-third the distance between Earth and the intended Starlink orbit. So the ISS is quite a bit closer than the intended orbit of this massive array that SpaceX is planning to build. But as I mentioned in the intro, geosynchronous satellites must stay above the equator and must orbit at 22,236 miles, or about 35,786 kilometers, above sea level. So about 32 times as far away as the planned orbit for the majority of these Starlink satellites. Which is a significant distance, even out in space. That's almost three Earths distance away from Earth while the Starlink satellites would only require a comparatively quick trip to essentially just be on the atmosphere. The main downside of placing satellites into such a low orbit in this way is that their orbit will degrade much faster than something higher up. Putting satellites way out into geosynchronous orbit gives them a substantial life expectancy, 
Many of the satellites that are out there today were launched in the 70s and 80s, and they're still humming along just fine. Satellites lower down closer to Earth, on the other hand, will have an estimated operable life expectancy of around five to seven years, which isn't anywhere near enough time to earn back the investment required to build and launch a traditional satellite. Now that said, there are plenty of upsides to offset the major downsides of having a lower orbiting satellite array. One such upside is actually predicated on that downside. These satellites will be built to last for a short period and then to degrade cleanly, to push themselves into the atmosphere, allowing them to burn up without leaving any space debris behind. And to do so within a shorter time frame than what's currently being tossed around as a near future regulation for such projects. These satellites would be able to kill themselves by making that atmospheric plunge within a year while it can take decades and a lot more fuel for satellites further out to do the same. Further, building for short-term use allows these satellites to be upgraded much more frequently. Those satellites out in geosynchronous orbit may be long-lasting, getting decades of use out of their investment, but the technology inside them is also from the 70s and 80s, meaning it's ancient by modern standards. Building for a shorter time frame means Starlink can always have the most modern, upgraded, and conceivably cheapest tech out in orbit, ensuring that a significant part of their array will be ultra-modern rather than impressively resilient, but antiquated. Being closer to Earth is also important for that internal use case that Starlink has in mind, beaming internet down to the planet. A lot of satellite internet today is unreliable and slow compared to what's available on the ground, funneled to buildings via fiber optic cables. Having thousands of satellites covering every patch of ground on the planet and close enough to the planet that the signal bouncing off them does not take ages to bounce back to the receiver planet side, that's a huge advantage. And SpaceX is currently trying to get permission to experiment using what are called the KU and KA, KU and KA bands which are wavelengths that are currently underutilized for satellite-to-ground communication, which means if they could be harnessed to communicate internet-optimized signals down to Earth with some new technologies enabled by that shorter distance from their orbit to the surface, SpaceX would be able to utilize a relatively clean frequency, which would allow them to offer more communications capabilities for the planet without further cluttering the existing, often overpacked frequencies that are commonly used today. Having these quick, degrading, low Earth orbit satellites also means that they are incentivized to create a production process that allows them to churn the hardware out by the thousands, which again, plays into the business-to-business -business aspect of this project, which provides them with the opportunity to build satellite buses that anyone can use for any purpose cheaply. And tying it all together, having an abundance of satellites to launch at all times means SpaceX can set up a more regular and more frequent launch schedule and can fill in the gaps in their launch capacity and the spare space and weight that isn't being paid for by another company on their rockets that go up by filling it up with more satellites, which they can then add into their existing array. And if that interconnectivity between projects wasn't enough for you, this satellite array is considered to be something of a test run for another array that Musk wants to build around Mars. So although the star man in his sports car took the lion's share of the press during this recent SpaceX launch, and the Falcon Heavy and its robot-controlled recyclable rockets took second place in terms of media attention, the two test satellites named Tintin A and Tintin B were also a vitally important component of this launch, of SpaceX's future plans, and of Musk's ambition to colonize Mars in the next few decades. So that's a lot to take in, and it's all connected to a variety of other fields. It's easy to spin off and talk about the interconnected impacts to just the car industry, just the energy industry, just the broader transportation industry, just the world of artificial intelligence, all of these spaces have compelling stories baked into them, and it's worth watching all the news and fleshing out your big picture view of them. Even if you're not super keen to get into all the details, a basic understanding goes a long way. But the space industry, and specifically the satellite industry, has its own larger tale to tell as well. 
Elon Musk is not even the only vaguely supervillain-like crazy billionaire involved in this corner of the economy, investing gobs of money because they think it'll be a good investment, and at least in part because they grew up watching Star Trek and reading the Culture series and want to play a role in pushing humanity out of its planetary womb out into the larger universe. Richard Branson, for instance, has backed a project called OneWeb, a project being proposed by a company called Worldview Satellites Limited, which would involve launching just under 900 satellites into low Earth orbit at around 750 miles or 1,200 kilometers from sea level, using the KU band, but not the Ka band, to broadcast internet signals down to Earth. This company has already bought up the satellite holdings of a few other companies alongside the frequency rights of those companies, meaning the businesses they bought had jumped through the hoops to acquire the legal right from the government to broadcast on a particular spectrum, and Worldview bought those alongside the satellites that were broadcasting on that spectrum already. This company was actually working in a non-committed, non-official partnership way with Elon Musk back in 2014, but by 2015, they had moved on to build a closer relationship with Richard Branson, founder and owner of The Virgin Group, and had formalized a relationship with Qualcomm, which makes all kinds of telecommunications equipment, especially things like semiconductors and modems and all kinds of other related hardware. Strangely, a recent story that hit the news just a few days before I'm recording this episode indicates that the founder of Worldview, a man who previously founded a satellite company called Terracom, which is one of the first companies built with the express purpose of connecting infrastructurally remote areas like Rwanda to the internet, founded a new satellite company seemingly with the intention of competing with Worldview, competing with himself, really, as the front man of Worldview. It's speculated that he did this, perhaps, because after bringing in all kinds of investors, he now only holds about 12% of Worldview, whereas he owns 100% of this new company, which is called SOM 1101, S-O-M 1101. It's also possible that he's trying to game the regulation system, planning to apply for access to one frequency range with Worldview and another frequency range with Psalm 1101, which would then allow him to sell one company to the other, giving the resultant larger company double the operational frequency to play with, which would be a significant advantage over other contenders in that space, like SpaceX's Starlink. At the moment, though, Psalm 1101's request for frequency access through the FCC, a request that is backed by Boeing, which is their intended hardware partner to build the satellites for them. It's being enthusiastically opposed by the other companies in the industry, including SpaceX, O3B, Iridium, and Telesat Canada. So this moment, right now, when all the requisite technology seems to be available, but none of these arrays have been fully put into place quite yet, it's an interesting time for the satellite industry. There are gobs of new ideas, of plans that seem to be right on the verge of being implemented, or which are currently being implemented, even if we're not hearing much about them yet, because they're still in their nascent stages of operation. It's all moving very quickly, and there's a whole lot swirling around if you choose to dive into the information that is available. Consider, for instance, Facebook's Aquila project, which currently revolves around the Aquila drone, an unmanned solar-powered aircraft designed to fly at altitudes of up to 90,000 feet, which is around 27,000 meters. This craft has been in testing mode since 2014, and in 2017, Facebook partnered with Airbus to work on the HAPS, H-A-P-S, which is an acronym for High Altitude Platform Station, Spectrum Allotment, which is regulated by the FCC within the U.S. and by the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, internationally. Through this union, if they can get the go-ahead to snag a chunk of broadcast frequency the next time the ITU meets at the end of 2019, the folks behind the project claim they can connect up to 66% of the world's currently unconnected areas to the internet by flying these unmanned drones, which look like massive, very flat, skinny planes, continuously around the planet. 
The Aquila project is just one example of what's being called an atmospheric satellite. Basically a satellite like you'd have out in space, orbiting the planet, but operating within the atmosphere instead of outside it. Just as there are pros and cons to operating in low Earth orbit rather than all the way out in geosynchronous orbit in the Clark Belt, there are also pros and cons to operating within the atmosphere instead of beyond it. Especially relevant in this case is the lower latency from being closer to the receiving stations on the ground and the ability to maneuver the aircraft to wherever it's most needed a capability that satellites would have a great deal of trouble replicating. The only real solution there is to have lots and lots of satellites, so there's always at least one within line of sight at any given time. And Facebook isn't the only company working on atmospheric satellites. Google's Project Loon uses high-altitude balloons to beam internet down to the planet's surface, and though they've been doing real-world experiments since 2011, and the project was officially announced in 2013, the first practical application of this project came in October of 2017, when they launched 30 balloons over Puerto Rico, bringing about 100,000 people online in some of the worst hit areas of the recently hurricane-demolished territory. NASA has also been conducting experiments with atmospheric satellites, including their Pathfinder and Helios series of aircraft, which were developed in partnership with the Japan Ministry of Telecommunications and a company called Sky Tower, which wanted to use them as, you guessed it, flying broadcast platforms. Though in this case, they wanted to be able to send 3G wireless communication signals down to Earth alongside HDTV broadcast signals. These experiments started in 2002, which was clearly a very different time in terms of what kinds of signals we were trying to access and found to be valuable. One more model I think we'll be seeing a lot of in the coming years was also demonstrated in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and the devastation that it wrought in Puerto Rico. AT&T launched their so-called flying cow drone over portions of the territory to provide data, voice, and texting services in areas where land-based access points were down. This drone was quite different from the atmospheric satellites we've been talking about thus far. Facebook and Google and NASA's entrance all operate way, way up high, up within the topmost portions of the troposphere and into the stratosphere, at levels where aviation administrations, like the FAA, no longer regulate the space, and where clouds do not form so the satellites can receive unlimited sunlight to power their batteries. The flying cow, on the other hand, is a more conventional low-level drone, built to hover at around 200 to 400 feet, which is about 60 to 120 meters above the ground. From there, it can project a cone of connectivity to about 40 square miles, about 64 kilometers, and though I couldn't find any information about how long it can hover up there before needing to land and recharge, I'm assuming it's a lot less than the potentially nearly unlimited time frames the higher-ups are looking at once all the kinks are worked out of their solar panels. Regardless, though, the flying cow is one more model within this larger framework, and it's conceivable, even likely, I think, that eventually we will see a network of such devices and vehicles and satellites that work at all levels, way out in geosynchronous orbit, all the way down to hovering just above street level. And further, even, underground, where the fiber optic cables are buried, all of it will work together to provide the best connection possible wherever we happen to be, whatever device we happen to be using. One of the major hurdles will be perfecting these technologies, and the other will be getting these various entities to work together so that customers and potentially, at some point, citizens more broadly, who have come to expect high-speed internet as a quality of life issue or even a human right guaranteed by their governments, and who can realistically expect such a right to be fulfilled, to be continuously available because of the infrastructure that's in place, people everywhere will be able to tap into this array, this mesh of broadcasting hardware from everywhere, from anywhere, and expect it to work up to a relatively high standard which is a far cry from where things stand today in many places around the world, particularly in the more rural regions of both the developed and the developing world. So in regards to how this all plugs in 
to the larger satellite industry. Having more players in this space, but especially players that are systematizing things to optimize their output to benefit from the economies of scale, like SpaceX is doing, that should help stimulate demand for new satellites while also bringing down prices, helping the flywheel of development spin faster in the coming years. Having satellites at lower levels, out in space but also down within the atmosphere, should help expand the wireless mesh of connective frequency, which, as long as everything is regulated properly at least, should lead to better signal capabilities in more places, rather than a bunch of signal clutter within just a few usable frequencies, and no signal in many locations like we have today. We will hopefully see more stringent and better practices when it comes to the destruction of satellites and other craft that are launched into space, as debris up there in orbit is a serious catastrophe waiting to happen if we do not get things under control very soon, and we'll hopefully see more and innovative use cases for all of these platforms, for those like Starlink's modular satellite buses, but also for low-level drones, atmospheric balloons, and the like. There are a lot of potential use cases for these devices beyond just providing internet services to people. A lot of research in particular could be done, which could help us better understand our environment and our societies. And it will be interesting to see what becomes financially feasible in that realm of inquiry as the prices come down on the equipment required to conduct such research. Finally, all of this development fits into the larger space industry by lowering the cost of launches and producing equipment, increasing the bandwidth available for in-orbit and beyond-orbit hardware, and making space-based manufacturing more feasible and reliable. Increasing the bandwidth out there might, at first, seem a little unnecessary. It's not like there are crowds of people out in space to use all that bandwidth. But as space fills up with more equipment, we need all those craft and satellites and stations and other bits and pieces to be talking to each other so they can work together, but also more fundamentally so that they don't crash into each other and destroy valuable equipment, turning it into plumes of dangerous space junk. Space-based manufacturing is also a fascinating field that's in its very early days. Some projects that are conceivable but not super practical right now because they depend on high mass equipment like spacecraft that can take us beyond the solar system and legit space stations that would allow us to survive beyond the Earth's gravity well for lifetimes, not just years. That only becomes realistic once we have, essentially, space factories out there beyond the atmosphere. Otherwise, we have to pay crazy fees to haul both finished components and raw materials out into space, which is prohibitively expensive. That might change if we could build a space elevator or develop anti-gravitational technologies, but for the moment, with existing technology, it's much more realistic to start building the scaffoldings and manufacturing capabilities out in space. So we can start figuring out how to use all those space-based resources to build stuff out there, rather than trying to move a bunch of stuff up there. Another facet of this potentiality is constructing things in space for use down on Earth. At the end of 2017, a company called, fittingly, Made in Space had one of their devices sent up to the International Space Station via a SpaceX Dragon cargo capsule. This device, which is a little bit bigger than a microwave, is a proof-of-concept manufacturing machine capable of producing a type of optical fiber called Z-Blan, Z-B-L-A-N, a substance that is like typical fiber optic cable materials in that it can transmit data, but it has better capabilities than the usual stuff. It's just super difficult and expensive to make on Earth, but relatively inexpensive to make in orbit because the lack of gravity allows the material to grow without crystalline flaws that otherwise have to be allowed for and removed down on Earth. The ISS also has a more traditional 3D printer on board, which arrived back in 2014, and they've been using it to produce products for companies on Earth, but also to produce replacement tools and parts that they would otherwise need to have sent up, again, at great cost, in a future resupply mission. So having more manufacturing capabilities up there would be great 
for that somewhat humdrum purpose, to make things easier on folks in orbit, and to make building things simpler. But it would also grant us some new capabilities, including the ability to make things that are tricky or impossible to make on Earth because of gravitational limitations or because they require a steady vacuum to produce optimally. More bandwidth in space increases our capabilities in this regard, and increasing our capabilities in one facet of this industry tends to have beneficial reverberations in other, even seemingly unrelated aspects of the industry as well. So what should we be watching for in this facet of the economy and of exploration? I'd expect a lot of new rules and regulations in the near future, some that will increase these companies' capabilities and rights, and some that will limit them, either for legitimate safety reasons or because of politics, and maybe even fear-mongering. I'd also expect to see a lot of corporate brinksmanship and public smearing and acquisitions, lots of mergers and partnerships on a level beyond what we've seen already. This is more of a Wild West than most industries, so there may be more weirdness, especially at first, as we sort out who is who, what is what, where the cards are being dealt. We won't even know precisely who has what cards or which cards are valuable for a few years, but there will be a lot of people grabbing as many cards as they can get, regardless, hoping that doing so will prove to be valuable for them later down the line. I also think that we'll be seeing a lot of as yet unseen interesting use cases for these technologies. Different things we can launch, new stuff we can build in space, data we can acquire with the right instruments pointed upward or downward and which can be transmitted and crunched efficiently. We may also begin to see other types of beaming happening within this mesh. We can send radio waves and microwaves, so why not wireless energy sent from giant solar panels in space down to receiving towers on Earth? Or maybe just sharing that energy with all the satellites in orbit. Giant solar panels that could serve as filling stations creating a new orbital and perhaps eventually beyond orbital energy economy predicated on new methods of delivery from the outset. We will almost certainly be seeing tourism-related products and services emerging alongside the infrastructural ones as well. It's already an open question as to who will take control of the ISS if government maintenance on the station ends, as it currently seems that it will in 2028. I'm guessing we will see other stations flown up and installed in orbit in the meantime, and many of these will be mixed use, but probably initially funded at least partially by wealthy folks who want to see and do something that is still out of reach for most people and will remain out of reach for most people for at least a few more decades. I'll also be curious to see how our attitudes about the solar system and the larger galaxy change as our comfort levels with operating in space changes. What happens when we start dropping relatively inexpensive satellites along our path every time we send out new probes anywhere? How will it change our perception of the solar system if we have usable high-speed internet around Mars, around Saturn, around Pluto, just waiting for us, already there, ready to be tapped into by future manned and unmanned missions? It seems like it could be similar to what Rome did for the known world, according to their definition of known anyway, with roads. They built roads out to the farthest expanses of their empire, except in this case, it would be information roads, making access to all of these foreign lands, cold, unwelcoming expanses of space, a little bit more welcoming, a little more accessible. And that change in perception and the many potential consequences of that change in perception, that could be very interesting. If you are enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron by going to patreon.com slash let's know things. Also super helpful is leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and sharing the show with a friend or family member, somebody who you think might enjoy it, or sharing it on your social network of choice. Word of mouth tends to be the best way to expand the audience of a show like this, so every effort in that regard, whatever shape it might take, is very much appreciated. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called Autonomous, and the author is named Anna Lee Nowitz, 
And this book, I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to give away too much about the plot, but I do remember when I was looking it over initially before I'd read it, one of the reviews about it said that it does for biohacking and bioengineering, gene engineering, what Neuromancer did for cybernetics, which is a pretty big statement, but I think it hits the mark because it's a lot of fun. The characters are very compelling, but the world in which they interact is even more so in a lot of ways, very compelling. And it shows the potential outcome of a collection of things that are happening right now. Things like CRISPR gene editing and the patenting of biological entities and components and the broader patent system and actually pharmaceutical companies and corporations in general, the re-empowerment of city-states and the diminishing of power within nation-states. And it all plays out from just a couple points of view. One of the main characters is a biohacking pirate who rips off patented pharmaceuticals and essentially sells what amounts to party drugs and focusing drugs and things like that to help her pay for the materials that she needs to pirate cures for the rampant and ever-present diseases that are found all over the world that she then gives out for free. She travels around in a submarine. And on the other side, we have some mercenaries who are hired essentially by a pharmaceutical company to go kill her. And one of them is a general mercenary type. The other is what's called an indentured artificial intelligence robot, a robot who is essentially created and then has to work for 10 years to earn its freedom. Humans in this world sometimes have to do the same. They can indenture themselves as a consequence of that law being created for artificial intelligences. And the AI is learning about itself, and his mercenary partner might be in love with him. And all the while, they are hunting down this colorful pirate character who lives in a submarine and travels around breaking patents. So it's a fun concept. It's well-written. It's a bit of a romp. I had trouble putting it down. It was a whole lot of fun, but also very interesting and compelling. If that sounds like something you might enjoy, consider picking up a copy of Autonomous by Annalie Nowitz. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at xllifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsknowthings.com. Feel free to reach out and say hello on social media. I am at Colin is my name on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube, etc. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. 